This morning we're in the book of Joshua, and we're going to start somewhere that isn't in the book of Joshua. We are going to start right here. It's this picture, a painting of an ancient, now British, warship. And let me tell you a little, bit of, a little story about this warship. Back in August, uh, August 23rd, 1741, a number of British ships left Portsmouth, England for a mission of extreme danger. They were to travel south near Brazil and Patagonia around South America's ominous Cape Horn to engage the Spanish on the west side of South America thousands of miles from home. Remember, this is 1741. The only ship out of this group of, I think it was eight different uh, men of war, the only ship to barely make it through the storms of the Cape was the HMS Wager, captained, captained by David Cheap, who had been promoted to his position only days before. Why? Because the previous captain died. After rounding the Cape, the Wager ran aground in a foggy storm with only a fraction of her crew surviving the ordeal. The survivors quickly found themselves starving without shelters suffering from scurvy, cold, and hopelessness. Then, in the midst of all of that darkness, there was Captain Cheap. He was as sick and weak as the rest of his men, but something was different about David Cheap. Uh, he was sick and weak, but Cheap set to work establishing order on the edge of chaos. He began to carve a British outpost in the middle of this impossible wilderness. And even as their meager provisions ran out, Cheap had the determination to rally his starving men to create a plan to continue their mission in pursuit of the Spanish. Yes, without even supplies, no supplies left, and they don't even have a ship. <laughs> he was driven to do whatever he and his men could do against every conceivable odd to pursue the Spanish ships without a ship of their own, like a good Royal Navy man can, would, would only think of doing. As long as he lived, Captain Cheap was going to leave nothing undone. The book is The Wager. It's an awesome uh, it's times unbelievable survival story of what a few guys can do that are rallied by the right kind of leader to face the impossible with the vision of this captain that says, I'm going to leave nothing undone. I'm going to, I'm going to pursue the mission no matter what the cost and no matter how bad it looks. He was committed to leaving nothing undone. This morning, I want to talk about what it means for us to leave nothing undone. So first of all, I want to orient ourselves to where we're at. If you're just joining us, even if you've been part of this Joshua series, uh, the geography, uh, the location, sometimes it's kind of confusing, ancient times, ancient cities, uh, so forth. So let me bring you to a map that I stole from my study Bible. You'll notice that some of the, if you've been following along, you notice that some of the city names look familiar. So right at the bottom of the map, I cut off where it says Dead Sea, but that's, that's what it says, Dead Sea right there in the central part of the map at the bottom. And then right above that, you see Jerusalem, okay? Right above that, you see Jericho and Ai. There's a question mark. Many ancient cities, we don't know exactly where they existed, and not all the uh, archaeological digs have happened yet, so uh, to, to determine with some uh, kind of accuracy where they're at. But anyway, as we've been studying, as we've been looking at Joshua leading Israel across the Jordan River, and you see how it kind of snakes down from the Sea of Galilee and how it dumps down into the Dead Sea, they crossed over the Jordan River into that area of Jericho and Ai. Now, where we're jumping into the story is chapters 10 and 11 that I'm going to give you some highlights of without getting buried into all of the details. But that area, kind of crudely shaped in that dotted 
uh, line of a rectangle. That's the area that the people, or especially the, the warriors, the fighting men of Israel, that's where they're at in this part of the story. As they move out and away from where they've been and taking into consideration all of these different cities, some of which we'll mention this morning. Now, as it turns out, a couple people from our church are in Israel right now, north of Jerusalem. Will and Julia Risto have been sending me little pictures and uh, a, a few videos here and there. I thought about sharing one of them this morning, but uh, the, the wind noise was just so crazy in the background. By the time we show it in here and to speak, you wouldn't understand what they said, it's what they're saying anyway. So maybe we'll have kind of an update from them because it really is kind of cool what they're doing. So they were invited to be part of an active archaeological dig to the north of where you see that dotted line. The arrow points down to uh, a city by the name of Shiloh. Now that area of Shiloh will be prominent towards the end of the book of Joshua. No spoiler alerts, but Shiloh is going to come up again, okay? Now, that's the area where Will and Julia are at, or at least were, when they sent me the picture. That outline, you see that red outline, okay? That's where they got to contribute some help in the hot sun, digging in the dirt. That doesn't appeal to everybody, right? I think that'd be fascinating. Now, uh, I'm, I've been sworn to secrecy, because they don't know exactly what it is that they're digging up in this area, uh, but they've got some clues that are leading them to believe they've discovered something very interesting. So if, they, if Will and Julia have the permission to actually say what yet, let the cat out of the bag, then maybe we'll do that as we study. I just think, I geek out on stuff like this. Uh, I think the timing, the fact that they're there and looking at this particular site and digging in the ground there, and how that coincides with where we're at in Joshua is really cool. So uh, we'll see when they get back, if we can uh, schedule the time, maybe as part of a Sunday morning. Uh, if they have enough information, uh, maybe a Sunday morning and another night, uh, uh, a separate night where we can talk more about what's going on, okay? So that's your teaser. There's something in the red line, all right? And we'll tell you hopefully more later of what that might be as it relates to Joshua and the end of the book. Okay, so beyond that, why is this important? What we do when we study the Bible, Joshua is no different. We look at real people in real places, in uh, real events in history. This isn't made up stuff. Just because it's ancient doesn't mean it's fiction. Because it's ancient, you have to be more careful with the text, but everything that, even the, the, some of the things that Will and Julia are a part of, and everything else that I read, and, and all the things that are coming out of the ground, literally, uh, on these different archaeological digs, everything points back to the credibility and the veracity of Scripture. I've never read anything. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the pastor. I've never read anything out there, like some... Uh, discovery that discredits something that's in Scripture. Everything just keeps pointing back to, yep, this is believable stuff. So if you've ever wondered, I'm here to tell you what, it, what they're finding out there just keeps underlining and underscoring real things, real people, real events uh, that we study about and that we talk about. You can be reassured that when you read your Bible, it's not made up stories. This is actual stuff. And what I get to do when I open up God's Word on Sunday mornings is to dig deeper into the real stuff and to pull out something for us to land on that's significant for us today. Not everybody likes history. If you're one of those people that don't like history, you need to repent. <laughs> history is so important to our lives right now. It illumines, it enables us to move forward, it keeps us, if you keep track of historical significant things, it keeps you from doing or repeating things that you shouldn't. Learn from history. We have the chance, as we look at Joshua, to keep learning from history and see how it applies to us. Real places, real people, 
Joshua and Israelites and the God that they serve and the God that they're responding to that we talked about this morning. He's real. And that's important and life-changing for us today. So, as we've looked already in, in Joshua, as the Israelites move out from that place where they started, as they move into that area, the, the dotted line kind of area, then we're going to read more this morning about Harem. Let me bring that up. Yes, Harem. We looked at this back in April. The word that in most translations, not everyone, but a lot of them, is translated one word, one ancient Hebrew word translated, devoted to destruction. And I'm not going to repeat everything from April, but there, I laid out what it isn't and also what it is. So real quickly, just a reminder, because it's significant, what, very significant what we're, what we're looking at here this morning. Harem does not mean ethnic cleansing or genocide or some form of ancient colonialism. That is not what's going on. No matter what you may have read or heard from somebody else outside uh, good biblical scholarship saying things as they look into it, that is not what's going on here. But what does it mean? So you see on the screen, not only do some people uh, translate harem devoted to destruction, but others also translate it meaning defeat comprehensively, or as we looked at Jericho and Rahab, if you remember that, Rahab and her family and how they were saved from harem. Uh, some other people translate it, removed from human use. And I pointed out just how significant that understanding of the word is for Rahab. Do you remember Rahab? Do you remember what she did? She was a prostitute. If there isn't, there's no better human life illustration she was used, not under her M. So I brought that into our picture so that you can see, yep, there is destruction and there is warfare in Joshua, absolutely, but not completely altogether about warfare. Rahab and her family, because of her M, were saved. This, the, the title the theme of Joshua is God saves. So remember that. I'll bring that out into the forefront this morning. So, Harem was God's action against sin and Canaan, and it was also his judgment as God worked through Israel to dismantle established, ingrained, sinful ways that, if left alone, if allowed to exist would eventually tear Israel apart, a tear them apart from each other and a tear them away from the Lord. God knew that all the way back, the covenant he made with Abram, all the way back to Genesis chapter 15, the Lord speaks to Abram. He establishes the covenant. Uh, and then as he speaks to Abram, uh, Abram, he also points out let me read this. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, as God is speaking to him uh, and uh, revealing so many of the things that God knows. Remember last week? Anybody here last week? They remember anything that happened last week? Okay, no hands. That's a little scary. Everybody's still awake yet, right? Okay, so last week we talked about God knows. In other words, his omniscience. So much more going on with that word than God knows facts and figures. He's like some big eternal dictionary encyclopedia set. So it's so much more than that. God knows every part and aspect of his plan from eternity past to eternity forward. There's nothing, nothing to surprise to him. Why? Because, he God, because God knows what it is that he has laid out. His plan is secure for all time. And we read a little bit of that in Genesis chapter 15 as he speaks to Abram, uh, chapter 15, verse 16, God says, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, his uh, uh, future generations, they shall come back for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The Amorites, big term, uh, umbrella term that covers a number of these people groups that are in Canaan at the time of Joshua, hundreds of years after Abram, and when God spoke to Abram and established that covenant. 
So whatever reason, God knows what he's doing. We don't know why. We don't know how, uh, why the wait. What is God doing in that? We don't know. All we have is a little bit here that God says, and the reassurance that by faith we can trust him that in the future generations, he says to Abraham, the time is going to come where these people are going to be judged for their sin, their iniquities. The time is coming. Joshua, Israel, Canaan, promised land, the time has come. Why? That time? What is it exactly? We don't know all the details. God knows. So, another reference to last week and what it is that God knows and how God is working, even though we don't understand all those details. So, Harem, one more thing. We're bringing it into chapters 10 and 11 here. God knows his plan and we see that now unfolding, chapters 10 and 11, that has to do with harem, and it's focused, that devoted to destruction, okay, defeating comprehensively, it is focused on certain cities that had kings, centers of authority and power and religious identity in Canaan. So if you have this image of God, you know, told them all, kill them all, and I'll sort them out later. That's not what's going on in the book of Joshua. God does not work like that. There are certain places, however, that because of the sin of the Amorites, because of what God is doing through Israel to judge these people, and because God is giving this, and God owns the land, God can give any land to anybody he wants. It's his in the first place, okay? So remember that, too. God's not stealing. Israel's not stealing. God can do whatever he wants. He made it. He can give it. So, He's doing that here, and the verb harem is used 14 times in the book of Joshua. Ten of those times is used in chapters 10 and 11. That's why I'm making such a big deal out of it, because it is such a prominent theme in this group, this uh, longer, bigger passage that I'm referring to. Harem is carried out, so here's the brief uh, rundown here, the summary. Harem is carried out on Jericho, and Ai, which we've already looked at, and their kings, Makeda and its king, Eglon, Hebron and its king, Deber and its king, the hills area, the Negev, the Shephelah and their kings, and Hazor and its king. If we t- we're not taking the time to read all those details, but as, as you do, chapters 10 and 11, you'll see that Joshua devotes those kings and those cities to harem. They're devoted to destruction, okay? So the fighting, all of that that's taking place to the north and to the south of where Israel first entered into this promised land, this region where they crossed the Jordan, all of it is building in the story. So it's not just a list. The narration is going somewhere for a reason, for a purpose, and we read the purpose in chapter 11, Chapter 11, verse 15, just as the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. That's the big picture. It goes back a few generations now. He left, that being Joshua, he left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Joshua did, just as Moses did, in obedience, okay, Just as Moses responded to what the Lord said, so Joshua is also doing the same thing. What did Joshua do? He obeyed the Lord in all things. He acted with strength and courage. We looked at chapter 1 earlier as we began our service. Do you remember that? Uh, The the, uh, commission that God gave to Joshua to be strong and courageous, that is exactly what Joshua did. He resisted the fear to shrink back in any of these circumstances, completely unknown to him. We always have to remember that. When you read scripture, you kind of know, you've got the spoiler alert already. You know how it's going to end up. Joshua doesn't. As he takes on these different cities, he's got the promise of the Lord, but in real time, these guys are standing up against him. That's what happens in chapter 10. These city-states, these kings, they're mustering their, their warriors, their strong men, and they have had enough, and they're coming out against him. Now what's going to happen? Be strong and courageous. But Lord, what are you going to do? <laughs> the Lord follows through. The victory is not just Joshua's in that sense, 
but it's God's. So uh, I want to bring out one part of the passage uh, in uh, Joshua chapter 10 that may seem well, kind of rough, because it is, but we need to look at it. So Joshua obeyed the Lord, he resisted fear, and he wanted to make sure, Joshua wanted to make sure that his leaders, his commanders, were doing the same thing. So after a number of these places have been defeated, in the midst of that, there's five kings that chapter 10 tells us about. Five kings that tried to uh, combine their, well, it did, they combined their forces to try to stand up against Joshua and the Israelites, and they failed. So these kings ran for their lives, hid in a cave to try to escape uh, capture. They didn't do so great because they were found out. Joshua and his men left them there, finished the battle, and then they come back to deal finally with these five kings. And that is in chapter 10. So what do they do? What's important about this? Well, chapter 10, uh, verse 22 Joshua says, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me from the cave. And they did so and brought those five kings out to him from the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, come near. Put your feet on the necks of those kings. Then they came near, put their feet on their necks, and Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Then Joshua gives the command, These guys are killed, and they're done. That's pretty brutal. That's warfare. And that was the end of their sin. The judgment came. Joshua gives an undeni undeniably significant and powerful object lesson to his leaders. Imagine that, being in that moment. There is an ancient connection. This is something that was typical in uh, ancient warfare. But wow. Come before these guys, these kings, on the ground, put your foot on their neck, and look and see and remember. This is what what? Joshua didn't say, this is what I did. This is what I'm capable of doing. What does he say? Be strong and courageous. The Lord will do this to all your enemies against whom you fight. This is the Lord's doing. The Lord can do this. Now, that's quite the image, right? So I want you to kind of put that in the back seat for a moment in your brain because we're going to come back to that because it is truly significant for us right now. What does this have to do with us? So let's get there. Let's get there quickly, okay? Ancient stuff, battles, kings, defeating the enemy, all that stuff. What does this have to do with us? Joshua left nothing undone in his time. That's what the narrator tells us. Everything we hear about Joshua is superlative in this book. He can do no wrong, basically. He is an amazing leader that God has raised up for this time, and he's left nothing undone. So consider this. Just as Joshua left nothing undone in his time, Christ left nothing undone for all time. Because Christ has left nothing undone, in his power, we can do the same. In his power, we can do the same. So where, where, how do I make this leap, this jump from Joshua to Jesus, okay? We pointed out at the beginning of our series, Jesus and Joshua are basically the same name. Yeshua, God or Yahweh. Yeshua comes from Yahweh, okay? Even sounds similar. God or Yahweh saves. Joshua, Jesus, same name. There's already a link going on there as far as the New Testament goes. The book of Joshua presents the man leader Joshua as not this amazing, just simply this amazing leader, but a leader who is a servant of God. 
Now, as we finish the rest of the book, I'm going to point out ways that Joshua parallels Moses and the fact that he is this great servant, not just a leader, out front of the army, telling people what to do, all that stuff. More importantly, Joshua is the servant of his people, just like Moses, attempting in every way to be obedient to what the Lord tells him to do. That's how Joshua uses his position of leadership over Israel to serve them, to be a part of what God is doing at this time, bringing them into God's promise and ultimately saving them in a very similar way. The Gospels present to us Yeshua, Jesus Christ. Jesus, Yeshua, is the ultimate servant of God his Father. Jesus came to serve the children of God by not just making a way, as the Gospels tell us, Jesus comes to serve us by making the way to God the ultimate promised land, the ultimate place of rest in our relationship with him. Jesus came, Mark 10, 45 tells us, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Joshua, just as Joshua left nothing undone, Jesus leaves nothing undone. The gospels show us how he came and how he served, becoming the ultimate servant for all people. And all of the gospel stories culminate in the Passion Week and how Jesus was arrested and tried the false crazy trials of the Sanhedrin and then before the Roman officials and then out for the flogging and then on to the cross. And what is it that he says at the end of his life on the cross, John 19, verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said what? It is finished. All of the work that he came to do to serve, not just ancient people, to serve us to give his life as a ransom for many, all of what he did to accomplish the finished work of redemption was done. So you see, that one simple sentence is far more than my death is about to happen. That sentence clues us in to the entire theme of Scripture. The need from the garden all the way through the brokenness of the promised land and the kings and all that the prophets said. All of the work that needed to happen, Jesus did it. Not just past, but in his time, even the criminal next to him. The criminal said, remember me. And what did Jesus say? Today you'll be with me in paradise and on into the future where we can then benefit from what it is that Jesus, that Jesus finished for our behalf. So the question I want to leave you this morning has to do with you and me. It has to do with what is it that we've left undone. Because Jesus finished the work for our redemption on the cross, we can take the next step in the power of his resurrection because of our uh, transformed life in Christ. We, like Paul, like the verse you see on the screen, uh, can finish well and leave nothing undone. At the, end of Paul, uh, at the end of Paul's life, he wrote this letter to Timothy, his protege. And what does he express to Timothy? Does he tout his successes? You know, after all, I did write most of the New Testament. Does he go on speaking of himself as some kind of egotistical thing? Does he have, you know, vengeance, mean-spirited words, all those who failed him along the way? None of that. What does he say? I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. I don't have this list of uh, uh, prominent things that I've done. What is it that, set Paul, that sets Paul apart at the end of his life? I still believe in Christ. I have kept him in the midst of the struggle, of the persecution, of the turmoil, of all that he went through. 
I've got Jesus. I've still got him, and I still trust in him. Think about that for a moment. All the things that you might be tempted to look at at the end of the life of someone. All the accomplishments. Everything is amazing. Or, or the things that we might consider, or the, the lives that we might consider not so impressive. Look what they didn't do. Right? What could have been done? What matters at the end of it all is if you know Jesus. It is finished for you. For you to understand what needs to be done has been done by Christ. And I believe it. I trust in him. That's what Paul says to Timothy. I have kept the faith. What in your life needs to be finished? What is it that's still undone? Let me give you a few things to consider, okay? This morning, first thing, am I showing mercy to evil? Now, I'm not talking about evil out there in the world. I'm just talking about what's going on in your heart. Am I giving a place, a sanctuary, so to speak, for evil to continue to exist in my life? Now, I'm talking to anybody now who claims to know Christ because he has finished what needs to be done, and as a believer, we can live in the power of the resurrection today. Okay? that's what Joshua didn't have that. He didn't. We do. As a believer in Christ, we can stand firm in the good news that all the New Testament talks about in trusting in him. But all of that is diminished if we give sanctuary to sin and continue to live in it, thinking that that, I don't know, how, there's so many different ways to look at it. That there's things that I can play around with and nobody knows. There are things that just don't matter, that aren't necessarily all that important. Whatever it is. Back to that image of Joshua and those kings. What did Joshua give his leaders? He gave them something to think about right then, right? He gave all of us something to think about in that moment. You put yourself in that spot, okay, right now. Now you are listening to Joshua, and you take whatever that is, the sin that you've left, the sin, the stuff that you're clinging to, the habits or the whatever it is, okay? If you've allowed that to live in you, take it out right now mentally, put it on the ground, Put your foot on its neck and kill it. Leave it dead. Choke out whatever life you have encouraged in that sin and wipe it out. And if it comes back to life tomorrow, and it starts twitching and like zombie-like or whatever, and it starts sneaking back into your heart, do the same thing thing in the power of the risen Lord who wants all of your heart, not part of it. If you've been holding back, kill it. Quit messing around with it. Don't hold on to it. And don't give evil a place to live anymore. Number one. Number two. Am I, are you rejecting a casual approach to your faith. Uh, I read, or I heard recently, I don't know the source, okay, but here's the pastoral guilt trip. Hang on, just hang on, okay? I'm saying that now because you're going to think that, so I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, heard recently the um, average, uh, average monthly attendance of churchgoers today is 1.8 times a month. All right? I don't know if that's Protestant and Catholic, mainline, all the denominations. I, I, don't, I don't know the source. But just use that as a starting point, okay? 1.8 times a month, less than half, because some months have five. So at the same time, I read some, uh, some um, research came, that came out by the Pew Institute that said uh, people, Americans, tend to view religious faith as the second most important thing in their lives. I can't remember what the important, I, I think the first one was family or family time or whatever. 
But number two was religion and faith. What does that mean? Well, not a whole lot if those two things come together as the way I see it. My concept of religion or faith, yep, that's important to me. But I neglect meeting with other people, with other believers on a regular basis. Now, there are all sorts of reasons why we're busy and our schedules are complicated, crazy uh, work schedules, and all sorts of variables that come into our lives. So it's not, this isn't a guilt trip. But I do want you to think about this. Because what we see and where the trends are going is people neglect the body and being with the body more and more and more frequently. Okay? That is happening everywhere. Large church, small church, different denominations, it's everywhere. So just ask the question, where am I at right now with that? You need the church and the church needs you. I don't know how many times I've brought this up. So it's one thing for people to think, yeah, do I need church or not? Or all these things going on? Am I really going to get dressed and go to church? Whatever. Okay, that's one thing that's maybe happening in your mind. But here's another thing. The church, as in the body of Christ, people around you, okay, not the building, people around you need you. And this is the one thing that I, I'm still, I should not be surprised at this anymore, but <laughs> I still am. When I bring this up with people, because when I mention that, maybe I mentioned to some of you in here right now, that the, the rest of the body needs you. What's the pushback? Oh, I'm not important. No one cares if I show up. I just sit there and mumble things and walk out or whatever. I don't know what you say. I'm not important. No one cares. That's garbage. It is a lie from the pit. If you're not here, someone else suffers every time just your presence to lovingly be a part maybe even for a moment to say something nice to be encouraging you don't know the times that you're not here and someone else in this group oh i wish i could have talked to so and so i wonder where they were at i miss them that happens every week that happens okay Every one of you is significant to at least somebody else, if not a whole bunch of other people in this room and to the people that aren't here. You matter. There is not one person that doesn't matter anytime at all. Is this sinking into you? I hope you take it to heart. This is not a guilt trip. The body cannot function unless it shows up and recognizes that we need, we need each other. It's that important. You are that significant. Consider today how you are that important. Do, where does this casual thing come from? I know we're busy, all that jazz, but you know what else? It is part of our culture, right? We're, uh, we're all so busy and we are allowing ourselves to be discipled by all sorts of other voices and things that are going on. Why is it that in the first chapter of Joshua that I had you repeat, be strong and courageous? And then during that reading, what else comes up? Do not let this law depart from your mouth, right? Meditate on it day and night. Then you'll know what God's will is. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Why does God emphasize that? Because of the Canaanites, the Amorites, the people that they're surrounded by that are filled with sin, that worship idols, that sacrifice babies. This stuff is happening. You've got to know, Joshua and Israel, how you are different than them. That's why Harem is so absolutely significantly important in what it is they're doing. You cannot let evil exist. And you cannot allow yourself to be discipled by all those other voices because they're going to seem appealing it's going to seem so right and so casually comfortable and i like it it's so easy to fit in to that mode of living don't you dare do it be shaped by god's word 
meditate on it, then you know what to do. If you don't meditate on it, you don't know what to do, and you'll grab any voice, any message around you at the time if it appeals and seems good. Man, this is important. Joshua is screaming at us how significant God's word is to shape our hearts and our minds. Don't lose track of that. Please don't leave it undone. If there's something that's coming to mind right now, or some way, I know, I know, yeah, he's right. For once, he's right. And just, think, just think about this. If there's something you've left undone with your own personal discipleship, in learning more and in, in treasuring God's word and in, in speaking to someone else, maybe there's someone else here this morning that you feel convicted on, like, you are important to me, and you need to tell them that. Maybe you've never told them that before, and it seems weird because we're Midwesterners. I'd get over that. Express to someone else your love and appreciation for that person. Bring, in just those few moments, bring our body closer together, make it function in a way that honors God and builds up someone else, and the body thrives because we make that connection together. If there is something you need to say, don't leave it undone. Maybe it's confession. Maybe it's repentance. Maybe it's just loving on somebody else. Do it. Why in the world would you leave that undone? Do it before you leave this morning. Be a finisher. Be like that crazy British guy who had, he had no idea. I love this book I'm reading. He had no idea how they're going to finish the mission. They had absolutely no way to do it but he was driven to accomplish it because that was his mission on earth. Joshua was driven. Let's be the people of God that are driven to do things that are crazy, that make no sense. Except for apart, you know, apart from God, they don't make sense. But in God, he can do all things, right? He's not limited by the crazy things that we say or, or do or believe. Romans 8, 31. What do we say? I'll close with this. All these things that complicate and frustrate and drag us down and get us into this defeated mentality. What then shall we say to all these things? If God is for us, if God is for us, which the answer is yes, who can be against us? What's the answer? Nothing! No one! God is for us. Let's live in that promise. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, you are the God who saves. Soften our hardened hearts. Humble us before your mighty love and grace. Enable us, Lord, to take action in the places and on the things that we've left undone. Oh, God, be honored in the way that we respond to you, even in these coming moments and in this week, give us eyes that see opportunities to finish and to finish strong because we know the living God is with us. In Jesus' name, amen.